Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ms. Lamont, you may proceed. People are far better than their very worst deed. And Jody Arias is a far better person than her very worst deed. Each and every one of you have your own moral decision that you have to make. Each and every one of you have to decide for yourselves if despite her very worst deed, her life still has value. Back in December, when we first started choosing a jury, we all talked to you and asked you that question about whether or not if somebody, if you found that somebody was guilty of a first degree murder and it was cold blooded and awful, could you still consider giving that person life in prison? And each one of you said that you could. This phase is different. It's different because the state of Arizona does not require you to execute somebody for first degree murder. There is no requirement. In fact, the state of Arizona, the laws of Arizona are <coughs> always satisfied with life in prison. When we talk in this phase of the trial, it is different because we are now talking about a different burden. This whole time, we have been talking about the burden of proof of beyond a reasonable doubt, and that the government had to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt, a very high standard. But we're no longer talking about beyond a reasonable doubt. And in fact, now the burden has changed. The burden has changed to a much lower standard, and the standard is now preponderance of the evidence. And what the judge has told you about preponderance of the evidence is that the defense, we have to prove to you now by a preponderance of the evidence that any mitigating factor is true. Preponderance of the evidence is a lower standard and what that means is that we have to prove to you that a fact is more true than not true. A much lower standard beyond a reasonable doubt. Those mitigating factors are a very personal decision for you. Um, each juror can choose to believe a different mitigating factor. And so when you go back to deliberate, each juror can come back with a different mitigating factor, believing that the defense has proven a different mitigating factor. In other words, there could be a total of 12 different mitigating factors that you find. You don't have to agree with your neighbor. Your decision is your own personal choice. It is your own moral choice whether or not you find it to be more true than not, that there is a reason to find value with Jody's life, that there is a reason to punish her with life in prison. You have every right to stand by your decision. And so whatever decision you make, you have every right to stand by it. You do not have to explain it to anybody else because it is your own moral decision to make. And remember, when we were talking to you back in December, when we first started choosing a jury, we talked to you about whether or not you could respect another juror's opinion. And that's what we're asking you to do now. Whatever your decision may be, it is your decision and yours to hold, and it is your personal decision to make. Mitigation is what we're talking about now. And the state has attempted to shape this case into, be, into something to be nothing more than lies and manipulation. Like somehow every word out of Jody's mouth has been nothing more than a lie and her own witnesses. That's what the state wants you to believe. 
and that somehow lying is appropriate now. That somehow the state believes because there's been lying that she should get the death, death penalty for that. But lying is not a capital crime. And lying does not get you the death penalty. And lying isn't even an aggravating factor. It doesn't even qualify someone to get the death penalty. Mitigating factors are reasons that give you a reason for you to believe that there is something of value in Jody's life. A reason to say that you can punish her with life in prison instead of execution. Mitigating factors are not excuses, and that is not why we're up here. They are not an excuse for what she did. You have already convicted her of first degree murder for that. So we are not up here to talk about excuses for why she did it. Mitigating factors are reasons why you can find that they are sufficiently substantial to call for punishment of life in prison. Mitigating factors are completely unrelated, completely unrelated to and separate from the first degree murder conviction. And the judge read to you in those instructions that you have convicted her of first degree murder. You've done that and we're this far. But mitigating factors have nothing to do with excusing that crime and, they have, and they're completely unrelated and separate now from the actual crime itself. Mitigating factors are reasons that you can find that are sufficiently substantial to call for life in prison. It is very important to understand, and this is in your jury instructions, that mitigating factors are not reasons that have to be connected to the crime. They, you don't have to find any connection between a reason to give her life versus the crime itself. Mitigating factors are reasons that in fairness and in mercy, you can find that life in prison is the appropriate penalty. For example, if one of you were to believe that someone who commits a murder when they're under 30 years old, anybody who is convicted of first degree murder who's under 30 years old at the time, I don't believe should get the death penalty. If that is a mitigating factor for you, if that is a reason that is sufficient for you to give that person life in prison, then that is your vote. That factor may have absolutely nothing to do with the crime itself. It may not be connected in any way, but that's okay. These are moral decisions for you to make, your own personal decisions. Mitigation comes in two forms. There are good things about a person's background and their character that they have done before. And there are bad things. There are things that have happened to that person that have somehow changed the trajectory of their life, who they could have been if it weren't for these things. Let's talk about some of the good things about Jody. things that show that she has value still in her life. Jody was just 27 years old when she killed Travis. And at the time that she did it, she had no prior criminal history. And I want to be clear about that. No prior criminal history means she's not been convicted of anything else before in her entire life. And when we talk about prior criminal history, we're not talking about someone who lies and who has lied in the past. Prior criminal history isn't about lying. It's about the type of criminal who goes out, commits a crime, gets a second chance, commits another crime, doesn't care about the person that they've hurt because they continue to commit the crimes over and over again. The type of person who commits a crime and gets a second chance, gets a third chance, and gets a fourth chance. Those are people with criminal history. And Jody does not have one. At the time that she did this, she had no criminal history, not until this conviction. That is a mitigating factor, and that is a reason to show mercy and to give her life in prison 
instead of being executed. <coughs> another mitigating factor, another reason to consider giving her life in prison is the fact that Jody was a good friend, that there are people who care about her. And when we talk about um, these people, you heard them when they testified during the guilt phase. You heard from Daryl Brewer when he testified about his relationship with Jody, and that they were together for four years, that he loved her. You heard that he was getting past a very bitter divorce and that he was very hesitant with his son, protective of his son. But he trusted and loved Jody enough that they became the three of them. And they were together all the time, taking trips together. Jody also, Jody also has um, friends, when we talk about the other people who've testified, the people who have told you that they were shocked, that they would not have expected this to happen. And those people were the state's witnesses. Remember Leslie Udy, who talked to you about Jody's personality and what she thought of Jody and how she thought she was sweet and how on this stand she told you that she couldn't believe Jody would do something like this. She was shocked. You heard from Ryan Burns, the person that Jody went to go see after Travis. You heard from Ryan that Ryan told you that when she would come to uh, these PPL meetings and these Super Saturday meetings, that these people enjoyed her, that she got along well with people. Some of you may be asking yourselves, what does it honestly matter if she was a good friend? Why? Look what she did to Travis. What does it matter now? It matters because the prosecutor wants to paint her as a one-dimensional character. A one-dimensional character who is defined by nothing else other than what she did to Travis. They want to do that because it makes it easier for you to execute her. But she is not a one-dimensional character. She had made so many other people happy in her life prior to coming here. You heard from Desiree and Dan Freeman. Desiree and Dan Freeman testified during the guilt phrase. They both told you that they took trips with Jody, Jody and Travis, that they went to Havasu Pai Falls, that they went to the Grand Canyon together, that they enjoyed spending time with her. In fact, Dan Freeman told you that Jody used to come to his house for dinner on Sunday nights and that they treated her like family, and that Dan considered her like a sister. <sighs> You've seen Jody's family here, day in and day out. And they are here for her now. And Jody asked you during her allocution to consider them. We know also another reason that gives value and adds worth to Jody's life now is the fact that she has always tried to improve her life. She has always tried to make the best of her life. You heard from Gus Searcy uh, during the guilt phase, and he told you that she was the utmost professional at PPL, that she worked very hard. You heard, told, you heard from Daryl. Mr. Brewer, that he told you that she was very responsible, that they'd bought a house together, and that she was always working. The prosecutor wants you to believe that these qualities don't add value to Jody's life, that they don't make it worth saving. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because if she is given the chance for life in prison, she will continue working to improve her existence and to add something to this world. And she talked about some of those things, like she's done already while she's been awaiting trial. Over three times she's been able to grow her hair long enough and give it to locks of love, which is for people to get wigs who've gone through cancer and chemo. She doesn't have to do that. 
but that shows you something that is valuable in her life. She has goals. Even in prison, she can have goals. And the fact that she's thinking ahead of what she can do for this world still is important and valuable. She has the ability to teach people Spanish. She wants to know, she knows that literacy is a, that illiteracy is a problem in this country. And she knows that she has the ability to teach people to read and to write. With her, we know that she's an amazing poet, an artist, and an excellent writer. She wants to use those talents to be able to dedicate, um, to de dedicate to the domestic violence awareness and to help people become aware of the problems with domestic violence. These are all goals that she has. And while they may seem silly and trite, contrite when you look at what's happened with Travis's family, these goals are something that would be completed behind bars in prison, not to get out. This has been a shock to the people that knew Jody. And you heard that even from the state's witness, Leslie Udy. It has been a shock to, to think that she was capable of such violence. And she told you this morning that it's a shock to her, but that she knows she did. And so you have, what we have to look at is why. Not excuses, but why. We have to look at what changed the trajectory of her life. What is it that made her come here? Given all her talents, she could have been a famous artist. She could have been an excellent saleswoman. She could have been a defense attorney sitting next to me. But she's here, sitting next to me as a defendant. What changed the trajectory of her life? When Jody was a little girl, it was just her and her little brother, Carl. They would play together all the time, chase each other around in the yard, having a great time, not come in until their parents called them in. At that point in Jody's life, when she was just a few years old, she could feel that the love from her mother. She felt that every time that her mother held her, that her mother fixed a scrape from tree climbing, she felt it every time that her mother read her stories. But a few years from that, that all changed. It all changed when she and her mother grew apart when they were no longer getting along. When her little sister Angela was born, things changed. Jody could feel it. Jody, can Jody all of a sudden was no longer getting along with her mother. She couldn't do anything right in her mother's eyes. She was getting grounded for inexplainable reasons. And when that happened, everything changed for Jody. as her relationship with her mother grew further and further apart. She watched. She watched how her dad treated her mom. And as Alice LaViolette told you, she learned the language of that household. She learned what happens. She watched her dad yell at her mom. She watched her dad ridicule her mom. She watched her dad tease her mom with cruel jokes. But through it all, her mom stayed. And from that, Jody learned loyalty. No matter what happens, you remain loyal. We know from all the psychological testing that was completed with Jody, we know one thing for sure that she has a very low self-esteem, almost no ego. We know that she suffered from depression starting with her teenage years. And so on that day when September 2006, when Travis came striding over with his arms stuck out ready to meet Jody, 
Jody was already in a vulnerable position. She was in a relationship where she wanted more. She wanted a family, she wanted children, and Daryl just wasn't at that point where he could give it to her. On the other hand, Travis talked about himself and about his strength in religion and how much he believed in families. Jody thought he was perfect. They spent time together that weekend and he impressed her when he took her to the executive director's bank, but the only way she could go was to be invited. And so a week later, when he wanted oral sex, she gave it to him because she didn't want to lose what she thought she had was so good. And a week after that, when Travis was sending over Mormon missionaries to her house in Palm Desert, she sat and talked with him every week until ultimately she converted a month and a half later. Jody put Travis on a pedestal. She believed in him, she trusted him, and she loved him. She saw all the wonderful qualities that his family already knew he had. And she loved that about him. But she also saw the other side of him. Whether you believe that Travis physically abused Jody or not, we know that he verbally abused her. We know this because you've seen the hateful words. You've seen what they have said. And it isn't just that he said these hateful words to her. It's the fact that he would say them one day, hateful one day, and then loving the next day. It was a constant yo-yo. I don't know how your heart beats in such a corrupted carcass. I hate you. You are the worst thing that ever happened to me. And then the next day, I love you. I'm sorry. You are the most beautiful person inside and out. You have to know that if Travis were sitting next to me in this, in this case, the prosecutor would be using those same words, those same hateful words against him. And so, yes, there has been lying in this case, absolutely. And Jody started with the most powerful lie, the most powerful lie that she told to herself, the lie she told herself about her relationship with Travis, the lie that you look into a mirror and you look at yourself and you say things that are not true, that are not the way they really are. No matter what anyone else argues, no person truly wants to be treated like that. No person truly wants to be called those horrible names. Don't be fooled into thinking that somehow Jody wanted to or deserved to be treated like that. But I want to be clear. It is not an excuse to kill Travis. And by talking about Travis being verbally abusive to Jody, we're in no way saying that that is an excuse to kill him. It absolutely wasn't. And you have already convicted her of first degree murder for killing him. But abuse is a mitigating factor. It is a reason to find that it changed the trajectory of her life. Look at how she reacted with Daryl. Look at the solid relationship she had with him for four years. And they were still friends after their relationship. Mitigation, and this is important to understand, what changed the trajectory? What caused Jody to be here? With all of this, a verbal abuse, knowing that it is not an excuse for what she did. Jody handled it the only way she knew how. She lied. She lied to herself. <clears throat> she lied to herself when she would pretend that those words didn't hurt. 
when she would pretend that those words didn't really matter, and when she would pretend that those words, that he didn't really mean it. She lied. And so when she did the very worst thing, worst thing that she has ever done in her life, and she told you this morning, it is something worse that she could never even imagine doing something so vile. And when she did something like that, so bad that she couldn't even accept that she did it, she lied. She lied to herself. She lied to the detective. She lied to the media. And she lied to Travis's family. But despite those lies about killing Travis, it does not diminish the abuse that she went through. It does not equal execution. She was once a bubbly and happy little girl. Somebody who always had a nose in a book. Somebody who loved to write in her journals. And somebody who loved to spend her days reading. She will be haunted by what she did. By what she did to Travis's family. By what she did to Travis. And by what she's done to her own family. She is haunted by that. What is so tragic about this case is that if either one of them would have sought help at some point for the type of relationship they were in, none of us may never have been here. And so we have to look at what else changed the trajectory of her life. We know that the state's own witness, Dr. DeMarte, came in and told you that Jody suffers from borderline personality disorder. She told you that people who have borderline personality disorder, often it comes, it results from a child who does not have their feelings validated by their parents. A child who does not bond, who's not able to bond with their parents. She told you that people with borderline personality disorder often have an immaturity about them and that they're prone to violent outbursts. Is that what happened here? Because if so, Jody cannot choose to have a personality disorder or not. It is not her choice. In other words, she didn't wake up one morning and think that it would be great to have a personality disorder. It is not something that people can choose when they have mental health problems. We know that it wasn't just Dr. DeMarte. We know that it was Dr. Samuels who told you also that she suffered from a personality disorder that was not specified. And we know that Dr. Geffner told you that a person can have PTSD and borderline personality disorder at the same time. They are not mutually exclusive. Having borderline personality disorder, having any personality disorder, is not an excuse. It is not an excuse for what she did to Travis. But it is a reason. It is a reason that you can find that is sufficiently substantial to call for life in prison. It is another reason that you have to be merciful. There is so much mitigation in this case. There are so many reasons that you, on your own, individually, can find to be merciful. That you, on your own, can find that are sufficiently substantial to call for life in prison instead of execution. And there is just one aggravating factor. Just one. The strongest mitigating factor that you have before you 
is the fact that she has no criminal history. This is not something that she was doing over and over again. And while what she did was absolutely horrible, you have convicted her of that. Jody took Travis away. She took him away from his family and she took him away from this world. But two wrongs do not make a right. Jody can still contribute to this world. Her life still has value and you have a choice. A well-known attorney once said, when with imagination and understanding and faith, we can look inside our own hearts and find that all life, all life is worth saving and that mercy is the highest attribute. We are asking you to find that Jody's life is worth saving. And to have the ability to understand that despite her very worst deed, you can still show mercy and find that she still has value in her life and sentence her to a term of life in prison. Thank you. Mr. Martinez. Judge, if we could have the uh, elbow. Yes. to his uh, family, to people that spoke to you, Travis Alexander will be forever young. You have been shown many photographs here of people going through the stages of life and how they've gone from children, have gone older, and you've seen the progression of life. But to his family, Travis Alexander will be 30 years, 30 years old for the rest of his life. And as they told you, they tried to remember him uh, as he was in, when he was in life. In fact, they tried to remember him as in Exhibit 661. That smile and perhaps that twinkle in his eye. And they told you, you know, we tried to remember him that way. They talked to you about that during their victim impact statement. But they also told you that they couldn't forget even though they remember him this way, they can't forget. They can't forget what happened on June 4th of 2008. They can't forget that on that afternoon, Travis Victor Alexander suffered immense physical pain. They can't forget that he suffered extreme emotional distress. They can't forget that. And they can't forget that it was especially Cruel. And that is something that you shouldn't also forget as you debate or you decide this case. You shouldn't forget what you saw in exhibit number. Objection, Your Honor.
should not forget as you deliberate this and determine whether or not this is, there are mitigating circumstances and whether or not you should consider them, you should not forget Exhibit 205. Because as his family told you, they haven't forgotten that. And that exemplifies or sets out this especially cruel crime. Especially cruel in the sense that it hurt, extreme pain, and extreme emotional distress. And that is what you need to take back with you when you are attempting to take a look at some of these mitigating circumstances that they have proposed for you. One of the things that they've argued to you and one of the things that they've told you, first of all, in their opening statement and now also when the defendant allocuted and as well as in the presentation that you just heard, that she is going to spend the rest of her life in prison. Although it's not listed as a mitigating factor, they did indicate to you that you could look to the circumstances to see if you find any mitigating circumstances on your own. The state cautions you that you are not private investigators or advocates when you go back into that jury deliberation to do your du duties as jurors. What you're back there to do is to find the facts. You don't advocate one side, you don't advocate the other. You don't go out on a limb and you don't investigate this to see whether or not there are any mitigating circumstances. For example, in this case, as you saw with Mr. Alexander, he is dead. And one of the things that you could find if you were being an extreme, and I'm saying an extreme advocate, is that you could say, well, he will never suffer cancer. Cancer is a horrible disease. She saved him from that, didn't she? Well, you could say, well, that's going to an extreme. It is going to an extreme, but it illustrates the point that you are not an advocate when you go back there. In terms of this case, there are no other, there are no mitigating circumstances that you can find with regard to the crime. They also tell you, well, she's going to spend the rest of her life in prison. If you remember when you filled out the juror questionnaire way back on December 10th or a couple of days after that. Objection, Judge Maria.
and made the argument that she's going to spend the rest of her life in prison should you choose that option. But I ask you to think back to the juror questionnaire, one that some of you began filling out back on December 10th of 2012. And in it, you were, it explained to you what the parameters or what this life meant. You were told that life in the state of Arizona meant two things. Yes, it could mean natural life, that the individual who is sentenced does not leave the Department of Corrections until their death. But that juror questionnaire also told you that an individual who is sentenced to life is eligible for release at the expiration of 25 calendar years. So when they speak to you about life, and when they talk to you about that as a mitigating circumstance, consider that as part of the argument, and consider that when you're looking at the rest of the mitigating factors that were proposed to you. And there were eight mitigating factors that were asked, that you were asked to take a look at. For example, one of them was that she was a good artist. And in fact, during her allocution, the defendant actually showed you some of her artwork. There was a, a diagram or a sketch of Frank Sinatra. There was one of Elvis Presley. And there was a couple of others that you were asked to look at. Because somehow, if you have a skill, you are entitled. Somehow those that have a skill get an easier path. Just because they are skilled, don't you know? That's something that you should take into account. Even though all it is is a skill. It's an entitlement road that they want you to travel. When they talk to you about the fact that she's a good artist, doesn't mean anything. All it means is that give her special or preferential treatment. That's what that means, and that is not a mitigating factor. They also tell you, well, she was only 27 years of age at the time that she killed, murdered Mr. Alexander. Last time that anybody looked, the age of majority was 18 in the United States. People go fight wars at the age of 18. But they want you to take a look at the fact that she was nine years post her 18th birthday. Additionally, if you take a look at her life itself, they sort of stood up here and told you what a grand relationship she had with this individual named Daryl Brewer. She was having a relationship that shows that she enjoyed life, she knew what a good life was, she also had parents that were loving when she was growing up. All of this sort of goes into the mix in creating an individual that was 27 years old, somebody that had previous employment, somebody who was intelligent, somebody who had been through other love affairs and had had a vast array of life's experiences at the age of 27. She wasn't 18. She wasn't 19 years old. She wasn't anything like that. She had already experienced life. So that is not a mitigating circumstance. At the age of 60, they could make the same argument to you. At the age of 55, they could make the same argument to you. She was only 60. She was only 55 years old. Yes, you consider the age, but you also look at the life's experiences that are associated with that. And she had lived, at that point, a very full life. As she indicated herself, she had experimented sexually. She had had friends, according to her. She had had a good family. She had been out in the world on her own and in fact was living a good life with Mr. Brewer out in California. So when you look at that, yes, she was 27 years old and she is 32 years old now. But Travis Alexander, he's 30 years old. He's still, today, 30 years old. And the person responsible for that stood before you in court and asked you to take a look at that. Only 27 years old. Well, Mr. Alexander only was 30 and will be forever 30. She showed you pictures of her yesterdays. She showed you pictures of her growing up. Mr. Alexander is no longer going to have any more yesterdays. Objection, Your Honor.
he's not going to have or be able to enjoy the experiences that she was telling you that she is going to miss. Holding a nephew, she told you. Missing Christmas. She told you all about that. And she showed you a photograph where they celebrated the Christmas with her, photo, with her there via a photograph. But Mr. Alexander. Objection, Judge, may we approach? She told you about how she's going to miss all these Christmases. She told you about how it is that there's only going to be this photograph of her every time they, that her family meets. How is that a mitigating factor when you take a look at the absolute horrendous violence that she heaped or put upon, on Travis Alexander? So no. The fact that she was 27 years of age is not a mitigating factor. Additionally, she also told you that she doesn't have any prior criminal history. And they told you, well, she's never done this before, so that shows what a good person she is. Well, if you take a look at that particular argument, usually people, when they kill in this horrendous fashion, usually the police go out and arrest them so as to not give them the opportunity to do this again. So when they tell you she never did this before, really that is not a mitigating circumstance. Additionally, a criminal history talks about, if you will, an offense to the public good or to the public order. Because if everybody were allowed to commit offenses, you would have anarchy in society. That's the part of the reason. May continue. We're talking about what a crime is. And one of the things that they told you, she doesn't have any history of this. Well, actually, if history is what we're talking about, weren't you present for some of that history? Weren't you present when she sat in that witness chair after taking an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and look each and every one of you in the eye and started to talk of the world and talk to you about the events leading up to the crime. Specifically, she talked to you, for example, I'll just pick one, the example about the gas cans. Well, most of you know what perjury is. That doesn't mean that she has been convicted. No one is saying that. But just because you're not convicted does not mean that you have not engaged in criminal conduct. Objection improper argument. Overruled. And with regard to her lying, they told you during their closing arguments, well, yes, after this happened, she did lie, and she lied to the police over and over again. Well, isn't that also a crime, to lie to the police during their investigation? But again, don't look to that. 
Just look past that. Just look to what we're alleging that there is no criminal history. There is a criminal. There is a history here. There is a criminal history, and this is not. Other you may finish your sentence. And this is not a mitigating circumstance. She also tells you that she was a good friend. And one of the things that we have to keep in mind here is that um, when we're defining friend, what does friendship mean? Doesn't friendship imply that you know the person better than most people because you have sort of a relationship where they're being, they confide in you and you confide in them and then you sort of have this sort of bond between the two of you. And they held out the fact that she was friends with Leslie Udy about this. And that Leslie Udy said, well, I would never have thought that she had done something like this. But wasn't that bond, if you will, between her and Leslie Udy one based on a lie? If you remember when the defendant went up after she killed Mr. Alexander, she went and spoke to Miss Udy. And what did she do? Well, she lied to her. And she told her, you know, when Mr. Alexander and I get married and we have kids, I want our kids to play together. Is that really a friendship when one person is lying to the other person? That is not what a friendship is. They also mentioned the fact that she had a friendship with Ryan Burns. That's the other thing that they pointed out to you. Well, if friendship means adjusting somebody, then maybe it could be a friendship. But, all, but she said that didn't happen because according to her, Mr. Burns is full of crap. That's exactly what she said. But again, when she spoke with Mr. Burns, again she lied to him. Again she didn't tell him the truth. So is that really a good friend who will come up to you and lie to you? No, that is not what a friendship is. And so if that is the friendship that they're basing it on, then this is not a mitigating factor. And again, all of this that is being presented to you during this phase of the proceedings, most of it, is, has come from the defendant's mouth. This individual that will not hesitate when the truth fails to come up with a lie. And so when you look at that and you see this allegation that she has a good friend and then you say, but she's the one that told me. The bottom line then is, is that really a mitigating factor that has been proven by a preponderance of the evidence? And there is a standard here. Is it more likely than not that when this individual here in court tells you that she has a good friend that for whatever reason couldn't be here, is that something that, based on everything that you see and judging the credibility of her as a witness, is that something that has been proven to be more likely Objection. true? Approach. This issue of why Patricia Womack isn't here was raised during the allocution. And this issue was raised by the defendant. Again, consider the individual, consider her credibility when you are attempting to assess or determine whether or not there is a good friend out there for the defendant. Nothing in the sense that 
there has been a preponderance of the evidence that has shown you with regard to this issue that the defendant has a good friend. The defendant also tells you that with regard to another mitigating factor is that she lacks support from her family. And then she talks about the other side of her mouth and says to you, well, they've been here throughout this whole trial. Well, which one is it? Have they been here throughout this whole trial or have they not? Have they failed to support her or not? Well, we know that the evidence has shown, for example, back in uh, August of 2007, that when the defendant had issues with peeping in the window into Mr. Alexander's home, and saw him with another woman after they'd broken up, what did she do? She contacted her father, and he supported her. And he indicated, and she indicated by her own words, maybe she's forgotten about it, that he was very supportive. When she was going to move back, who did she call? She called her mother. And she called her mother, and her mother came out here to help her move. Additionally, she talks about her brother in very glowing terms. So she did have this family support. She has not proven that by a preponderance of the evidence. Again, you don't just consider what she says here in allocution. You take a look at the whole panorama that you have before you so you can get the full vista of this individual's life and the full vista of her statement of the allocution as part of this whole view of her universe. She also, again, goes over this issue about suffering abuse and neglect as a child and as an adult. Presumably what she's talking about when she talks about abuse as, an, as a child is at the time that she liked to play the victim. At the time that she liked to play the victim even though she wasn't a victim according to those that were growing up with her. And at, at a time when she was manipulative and used to like to manipulate people. That's the kind of individual that's telling you, well, no, I was abused. Additionally, there are no school reports of any abuse. There are no medical reports of any abuse. There's no police, there are no police reports of any abuse. There isn't... Objection. It's inappropriate argument. That's not just... okay. Did you ask to approach? Yes. Yes, you may approach. We talked about this issue during the guilt phase of the proceedings, and that's what the evidence showed, that there were no reports of any kind, none whatsoever, with regard to any abuse at all when she was a child. The only thing that we have is somebody that was growing up with her saying that, well, the defendant likes to play the victim, even though she was never abused. And that's according to Alice Laviolette. As an adult, of course, they want to rehash, replay, continue to their frontal attack and to smear Mr. Alexander. And they Objection, you And she indicates to you during her allocution, that was never my intent. I wanted to keep it quiet. But are there any, as we determined during the guilt phase, are there any medical reports to support it? Are, are there any police reports? Are there any 911 calls? And she tells you, well, the reason that there were no 911 calls is because earlier on, when I did call and I was in this relationship with Mr. Juarez, nobody came, so therefore I didn't call. There is nothing to corroborate this. And so they have not carried their burden by a preponderance of, it, of the evidence, more likely than not, that she suffered any abuse as a child or as an adult. And then they tell you that, well, with regard to six and seven, she tried to make the best of her life and that she's trying to improve herself. If you take a look at that statement, what's it act, what it actually is telling you is that she's just going through life. But isn't that what everybody else is doing? There's nothing special mitigating about it. Don't most people want to improve their life? Don't most people want to make the best of their life? She's doing the bare minimum the absolute bare minimum that everybody does. People try to do the best in their job. They try to do the best in their relationships. She's doing the bare minimum and wants you to look at that and say, aha, 
That's a mitigating circumstance. When a mitigating circumstance, when all she has done is met the minimum requirement. None of these are mitigating circumstances. And none of these, if none of these are mitigating circumstances, then the, then the uh, jury instructions tell you what to do. And they tell you what to do if that is the case. If all of you find that there are no mitigating circumstances, then you have a verdict to find. It is in the uh, mandatory form. There is no discretion as to what verdict you are to return if you find that there are no mitigating circumstances. But some of you may say, well, maybe some of these may be mitigating circumstances, although the state disputes it. But the jury instructions tell you that in determining whether or not life or death is appropriate, and if you do find mitigating circumstances, any connection or lack of connection may impact the quality and the strength of the mitigation evidence. So if you find, for example, that being a talented artist is a mitigating circumstance, what does that have to do with the crime? That affects the quality or the strength of that mitigating factor. The same thing with regard if you find that 27 years old is somewhat a young age, how does that affect the crime? How does that affect the strength or the quality of that mitigating circumstance? It shows you that they are not worth considering when you take a look at the horrific nature of the killing. If, and if you find that, there, that she does not have any prior criminal history and you find that that's a mitigating circumstance, even though she, you know she has committed other crimes, again... Objection. Oh, may continue. It doesn't have anything to do with the crime. And the same thing with being a good friend, or that she lacks support from her family, or that she was neglected as a child and is trying the best to improve herself. Under both of those scenarios, and those are the scenarios that you may have, where none of these are mitigating circumstances, or some of them are mitigating circumstances, as you may find them, that if you find that some of them are mitigating circumstances, they don't have any connection to the killing, and therefore they are not entitled to much weight. It's the state's position they are entitled to no weight. But once you have that, the jury instructions tell you that in finding it, in reaching a decision, you have to engage in a sort of analysis. And this analysis that you are to engage in is no different than the analysis that you undertook with regard to the first phase of these proceedings. You took a look at the facts, you took a look at the law, and then you applied it, and then you reached your verdict. The same thing with regard to the second phase involving whether or not this crime was especially cruel. You looked at the facts, you looked at the law, and then you applied them, and then you reached your decision. That is exactly the same thing you are being asked to do here. You are asked to determine whether or not this mitigation, if there is any, because if there isn't any, that ends your inquiry. But if there is this mitigating or these mitigating circumstances, you are being asked to determine whether or not they are sufficiently substantial to call for leniency, and that means the mitigation must be of such quality or value, again, whether or not there's this connection, that it is adequate to vote for a sentence of life, sufficiently substantial to call for leniency. Nothing that they have presented here, nothing that has been presented in any of the phases is a mitigating circumstance. But if one or two of you, or perhaps more than that, find that one of these factors that they set out for you, of these eight, is a possible mitigating circumstance, is it sufficiently substantial to call for leniency when you take a look at what this individual did. And in this particular case, applying this to this particular case, and though they've talked to you about the ages and they've talked to you about everything, when you take a look at that and you consider that, and you can consider victim impact statements when you make this determination, one of the things that you will take back with you is that Travis Alexander, will never be more than 30 years old. That is his age. 
This individual in Exhibit 661 That's it. That's as old as he is going to get. And taking into account that there are no mitigating circumstances, and even if you find some, it is not sufficiently substantial to call for leniency in this case. And in applying the law to the facts, in this case, to the so-called mitigating circumstances, considering the allocution in this case, you have a duty. And that duty really means that you actually do the honest, right thing, even though it may be difficult. And in this case, the right thing, the difficult thing in this case, and it, because it's never easy, her duty, the difficult thing to do under these circumstances, the only thing that you can do based on the mitigating circumstances and their lack of is to return a verdict of death. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a 15 minute recess. Please be back in the designated area at 2.45 and we will start promptly at that time. Please remember the admonition, you are excused. Please back for the jury. Anything before the recess? No, thank you. We are at recess.